So I'm telling this to my dad. I said, Dad, you'll never guess. Mom used to work with, you know, Bruce Springsteen's mom. And my dad says, well, I work with Jay Giles' father. No way. Are you <laughs> said, kidding me? What are the odds <laughs> of that? Hey, this is Gary Peel from the band Boston. And you're watching and listening to The Tony Pruitt Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Tony Pruitt Show. And today's guest is a true rock and roll legend. He is currently the, the lead guitarist for the band Boston and The Roads. And he's also played with Sammy Hagar for about eight years, along with several other bands. Please welcome the very talented Gary Peel. How you doing, my friend? Hey, Tony, I'm doing great. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. It is such a pleasure to have you on. I was going to wear my Boston t-shirt for you, ah. but I got it in the mid 80s and there's no way I can fit in that thing. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the closest thing I can make that is, is a, maybe a bandana. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so anyway, so you're in Boston, right? I am in Boston and in Boston. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So how's the weather in Boston right now? Uh, they're expecting about 12 inches of snow tonight. You're kidding me. So we're kind of looking forward to it. But on the other hand, you know, I'll be out there shoveling the driveway. Oh, my Lord. Well, it's nice and sunny here in Texas. So, yeah. So, uh, so you're the guy that I've been listening to for so many years playing those great riffs. What a what an honor it is to finally see you. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I, you know, count my lucky stars of being in the right place at the right time to be able to join first Sammy Hagar's band and then Boston. So I, I don't know if I, I have time to digress to tell you that story. Oh, it's one of my questions coming up. We're going to we're going to get to it. OK, so bef before we start, tell me about your family. Uh, OK, I could go way back and he here you go. Here's some information I bet you didn't know. And a lot of people don't. Uh, my last name is Peel, P-I-H-L. And people say, oh, what is that? Uh, so, well, it's, it's like the chainsaw, steel, S-T-I-H-L, right? So mm -hmm. it's Swedish. But my great-grandfather uh, came over here from Sweden, and his name was Holcomb Hawkinson. But he hmm. changed his name to Peel to make it shorter. Now, of course, he lived in a Swede community. So instead of, instead of spelling it, you know, P-E-E-L or something like English people, well, he spelled it like the other Swedes did, you know, yeah, P-I-H-L. Sure. So it's not a very, either one of us, not a very common name. And I've never met another Peel that I wasn't direct, directly related to, you know, like a cousin or something like that. Yeah. Right. So they're not, not too many. But every once in a while, somebody says, oh, I know some other Peels in the other town or something like that. But I've never met them. I'll be darned. So, so that anyway, that's that part of the the. So then, uh, of course, my uh, dad and my uh, mother were uh, born and raised in Illinois. That's where they met, and uh, my father's mother, my grandmother, played organ. Uh, my mother also sang in um, like theater groups and things like that. In fact, she continued to sing in theater groups, you know, for fun after she'd retired, and uh, in her eighties. And some of the years where Boston wasn't on the road, we'd take that time off or whatever. We didn't tour every year. Uh, she'd have more gigs than I would. <laughs> so, so there's some musical background. I've got a cousin who danced uh, in the Juilliard School and then went on to, to dance with the Elvin Ailey group. So uh, there, there's been some musicians and, and uh, dancers and stuff throughout our, our family. I understand you've been married to the same lady for quite a while. Quite a while. 47 years. Amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. We, well, thanks. We met in high school, so that right. and and waited ten years to get married. So, so we've been together for fifty-seven years here. It looks like it's going to stick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm counting on it. <laughs> so you started playing in junior high. You had a band in junior high. Yes. How did you? How did you decide to form a a home studio, a recording studio? And how did you do that? How did you know oh. how to do that? Well, gosh, uh, I'll go again back a ways. So um, when I started off, uh, recording studios were pretty basic. Uh, I remember we went into the Fantasy Recording Studio uh, in San Francisco. Uh, they were the places, the place that recorded uh, Vince Guaraldi, you know, the penis. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. You know, he used to record uh, there at Fantasy in San Francisco. And then they actually moved over to Oakland and uh, uh, Creedence Clearwater recorded over there. Anyway, wow. uh, so, but in those days, 
a four track was all they had. And that was, you know, that was state of the art, you know. And of course, if you read about the Beatles, they did the uh, Sergeant Pepper on two four track machines because that's all there was at the time, you know. So things were pretty basic. So uh, I had been around other folks that had like a two track, you know, a stereo tape deck. And we, you know, put those together, record some tracks on one and then bounce on the other, which is exactly what the Beatles did with the four track recording. They would record onto three tracks and bounce it to the fourth and either another machine or anyway, you can read all about that, you know. And so that's how I started just with friends that had a couple of machines and we'd put them together and, and then in my mind, it was Tom Scholes from Boston that invented home recording. Uh, he worked at uh, Polaroid. He had gone to MIT and was a terrific mm -hmm. uh, uh, engineer there and worked at Polaroid. He's got like 29 patents on different devices that he invented wow. while he was at, at Polaroid and saved up his money and bought some uh, professional recording gear. And at that time, that was a 12 track, which is kind of unusual. Uh, and that's what he recorded the first Boston album on in his basement. And so when that first album came out, of course, it was fantastic. And it was the oh. biggest selling debut album ever until I think Whitney Houston came along or something. Uh, and people found out and said, well, how'd this guy do that? He recorded in his, in his basement. Well, shoot, if he can do that, so can we. And so lots of other musicians that had some amount of money would, you know, starting to buy equipment. And then the companies said, well, instead of a you know real professional we can make a semi-pro version of that and so Tascam and otari and fostex and those companies started making uh, other formats that were more affordable for we home recorders and so that's that's what uh, we did we we bought like i bought an eight track uh, half inch machine a Tascam, uh and recorded my friends uh, the, of course, the one that, uh, comes to mind right away is Night Ranger. Yes. Uh, when I was in Sammy Hagar's band, our keyboard player left to form Night Ranger with the other guys hmm. and <clears throat> they needed a place to record some demos. It's an, eh, come over to my house. And I recorded them, you know, in my living room with my eight track recorder, uh, That's a bunch crazy. of songs. Yeah. One of the songs that they recorded was Sister Christian. Love it. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and plus a, a bunch of other friends came over to record. And darn if someone out of every one of those bands, and there were like maybe, you know, a half a dozen or so bands that I recorded because uh, I didn't have that much time. But uh, somebody out of each one of those bands went on to have gold records, you know, in further in their career, you know, uh, Eric yeah. Martin with the, uh, uh, Mr. Big, uh, Paul Taylor with Winger and uh, Alice Cooper. Uh, uh, shoot. Uh, well, of course, Denny Carmasi went on to play with Hart. And anyway, it, it, John, Donnie Baldwin with Starship. So it, it goes on and on. That's amazing. And again, I, I was just doing it for fun and for the experience of it and trying to help my friends, you know. And so I didn't show so, anything. <laughs> that is so cool. That's a good story. So I'm going to take you back to the 60s first. Oh, I understand, okay. uh, so I understand when you started, you played with Free and Janis Joplin and War and some other people like that. We got to did, open did, for those people, yeah. That's awesome. Did you get to meet Janis Joplin? Did you get to know her at all? No, I can't say as it did. You know, we had a dressing room next to her and, you know, smiled and waved as I walked by, and that was about right. it. But we got the gig, actually, because her, her tour manager – uh, was a guy that we had known back in the San Francisco area. And so he knew her very well. He was the tour manager, you know? Right. Sure. So, uh, so uh, anyway, he thought she was of course terrific and which she was and what a great uh, entertainer she was, you know? And uh, also uh, I worked for, well, uh, one of my bands was on a label called studio 10 records. That was again, based in a basement in San Francisco and her band came over there to rehearse in our studio space, the, you know, the full tilt boogie band, you know, so this was after Big Brother. So again, I didn't get to meet her at that time because when she was coming in, they said, okay, everybody's got to leave, you know, we got sure. to uh, to watch the band warm up, you know, but then when she was coming, it's like, okay, you know, closed <laughs> rehearsal. <laughs> See you later. Yes, right. Yeah. Um. So tell us about what you got going on right now with the roads. I know you had an album hit last November, I believe. Yes. 
All right. So tell, t- tell us about that. Okay. So uh, it was released on Escape Records from England. And I've known them for almost 30 years uh, because I'm in another band uh, on and off called Alliance. Correct. And that's uh, uh, Dave Lauser on drums from Sammy Hagar's band. And again, we had Alan Fitzgerald with us, who was, again, in Sammy's band, and then Night Ranger. Uh, and then Robert Berry, who was in a band called Three with Keith Emerson and Carl Palmer. And Greg mm. Lake had left at, at one point, and they needed a, another singing bass player. And through Geffen Records, they found Robert Berry. And, and uh, so they couldn't be called Emerson Lake and Palmer without Lake. And so they changed the band to the numeral Three. And they okay. had uh, an album out, and, and it did well in the progressive rock uh, area. You know, that's that's what they did, mm-hmm. obviously, like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, you know. So uh, they did that. And that's how we got to meet Robert. Uh, when I was in Sammy's band, he, of course, got the opportunity to join Van Halen. And right. uh, he said, gosh, you guys are such a good band. You should just get some other singer and keep on going, you know, like, don't break up the band. Uh, and so... Geffen Records put us together with uh, Robert Berry, but we didn't quite have time to connect with him at that point. Uh, again, when I was in Sammy's band, almost one of the first gigs we did was to open up for Boston at the end of their first tour in 77. Of course, the first Boston album came out in 76. They were still on the road, 77. Our manager knew their manager. We got on the last bunch of dates with them for that tour. And they liked us. We liked them. And they said, hey, you guys should open the entire second tour for us. And that's just what we did all over the U.S. for like nine months, every state in the union, you know. Right, yes. More than once. (laughs) And uh, that's when we got to meet the guys in Boston. And so when Tom Scholes from Boston uh, heard that Sammy was going to join Van Halen, in 1985, uh, he called me up and said, gee, I'm working on the third stage album right now. I wonder if you'd come over and help play on it. There's one more song that needs to be recorded. I wonder if you'd come and play on that. Well, of course, I said, are you kidding? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd crawl on my hands and knees to come to to play on a Boston album. And so Absolutely. I left from, yeah, I left from our last gig with Sammy, which was Farm Aid One out in Champaign, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Flew directly from there to Boston to start working with Tom. And after a few weeks working there, he said, gee, I think we work well together. Why don't you move back here? We'll finish this album and we'll tour and we'll make another album and we'll just take it from there. And so I've been here ever since. I'll be darned. So how did you join Sammy Hagar? I was in the San Francisco Bay Area, as was he at the time. And he had been through a few guitar players uh, and we were actually looking for a singer and somehow our manager tracked him down and, and, uh, we said, Hey, we'd love to have you join our band. And he says, well, I, I got a band, but I need some gigs. Can I open up for you guys? And so Sammy actually opened for us at a couple of club dates there in, in the San wow. Francisco Bay area. And so we got to know him. And, uh, and so then, uh, again, our band was Again, always looking for singer, never found one. And, and so our manager said, gee, why don't you join Sammy's band? And I said, well, he's been through like a half a dozen guys. He'll probably hire me and kick me out in two weeks. You know, what's the point? You know? <laughs> right. And, and uh, he said, well, well, you know, why don't you talk to him? And so I, I called him up and found out he was a really nice guy. And I tell this story, especially to younger musicians, like, hey, how'd you get that first gig, you know, with Sammy? It's because his previous guitar player had OD, died, shooting wow. cocaine in the bathroom of a gas station. Oh my gosh. So they hear that story and go, Oh, okay. So Sammy, you know, when I was talking about, I said, Hey, Peel, you're not in the drugs, are you? I said, no, why? <laughs> and he said, yeah, why don't you come down and jam with us? And so I go down to jam with them and, uh, you know, audition, whatever, and playing the songs. And his manager calls up and says, Hey, there was a gig with queen and thin Lizzy queen had to cancel thin Lizzy's going to headline. You guys could be the opening act if you have a guitar player. So of course, Sammy turns to me and says, Hey, can you do the gig? It's in two days. And of course I said, sure. Oh my gosh. So I did actually, there were two shows. I I did the shows. And then after the second one, I'm like saying goodbye to the guys. Hey, thanks for having me. And I just figured they were going to continue on the audition process or whatever. And I was saying goodbye to Bill Church, the bass player. And I said, well, thanks a lot. It's been great. I'll see you around. He goes, no, no, 
oh, you're in the band. <laughs> I said, oh, well, nobody really told me it was official. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. So yeah, let so me ask you, tell me about the incredible Brad Delph. What do you remember about him? He had an well, unbelievable voice. Yes, absolutely. And and Sammy actually named him the nicest guy in rock and roll. Oh, really? And he was terrific. And so, of course, I met him there in 77. And as a matter of fact, we... Uh, we were on the East Coast. I probably we had done the town of Boston, you know, played or whatever. And we had a few days off, but we lived on the West Coast. And of course, Brad lived, you know, in Boston. And and so I was lamenting to Brad, I said, Oh man, I got three days off, but if I go home, that'll take a day to get there, you know, <laughs> plane flights and all this. And then a day to get back, I'm only gonna have well, like one day home. It's like I guess I'll just stay here in a hotel, you know, because that's what some of the other guys were doing. And Brad said, well, look, why don't you come stay at my house? And I said, okay, sure. You know, <laughs> I didn't know all that well, but I said, okay, great. And he was married and so uh, stayed with him for those three days. And so that's when I started to, to get to know him. And and then again, once uh, uh, we did the whole tour together, we'd hang out and and chat. And so he was just, again, the nicest guy ever, you know. He seemed uh, like a nice guy. I'll, I'll tell you one story. Uh, so uh, as as the opening act, uh, we didn't often get a sound check, you know, just sort of like, okay, put your gear on stage and, and go. But one day we were going to get a sound check because there was plenty of time and the crew had set up all the gear early or whatever, you know, the, the lights and sound, which always takes a long time to do. And uh, uh, we were back at the hotel and they call us and said, hey, come on over. If you guys want to do a sound check, you can do it today. I said, okay, great. You know, so we, you know, pull in, we walk in the back of the arena and here's Brad pushing my amplifier up the ramp onto the stage. Huh. Brad, what really? are you doing? I'm just trying to help out. You know, I know you guys don't have much time. I'm just trying to help, you know, pushing my wow. <laughs> Brad, wow. even I don't do that. We got stage hands to do that. You know? <laughs> so, so that's it. Sammy named him the nicest guy in rock and roll. Just trying to so help out. Sounds like it. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the band Alliance. When did y'all form that? That was in about 91. So gosh, yeah, 30 some years ago now. And Time flies. Yeah. So uh, again, I had uh, recorded that album, the third stage album with Boston and done that tour. Very successful. You know, we did nine nights at the Worcester Centrum and, you know, three nights at the Forum and things like that. Uh, and uh, so Tom said, well, we're going to take some time off. If anybody has any, you know, solo projects or any other things you want to do, now's the time to do it. Go ahead. And so I called up my buddies from Sammy's band because I enjoyed playing with them. So again, Dave Lauser on drums and Alan Fitzgerald on keys. And they said, yeah, okay, sure. And I said, do you guys know any singers that we can get or, you know, singing bass players? And they said, well, as a matter of fact, Geffen had told us about this guy, Robert Berry. And so we actually got together in Sammy Hagar's basement, he had a little studio down there uh, to try out Robert Berry. So we all met there at Sammy's place and uh, went through some song ideas and we just clicked. You know, we could tell this guy liked the same kind of music we did. And of course, a terrific singer, bass player. I found out later, he's also a terrific drummer, keyboard player, guitar player. He does it all. Wow. Uh, but uh, at the time, we were just looking for a, a bass player. Yeah. Wow. So. What is the difference between playing in the band Boston and Sammy Hagar? What's the difference for you? Do you do well, uh, one thing people ask me, what's the difference between like Sammy and Tom Scholes, you know? Yeah. And so I said, Sammy, you know, is a terrific guy, you know, and what you see is what you get. You know, you see him on TV and cooking shows or this or that, you know, he's just always a wild a, guy. Yeah. Always in a good mood, you know, fun loving guy. And that's the way he was, you know, all the eight years I was in his band. And, and you know, we were struggling to start off with, uh, you know, because nobody knew who we were, nobody knew who he was. Some of the people remembered Montrose that he was in that oh, yeah. band. Absolutely. But, yeah, we'd, we'd go down south, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, and uh, they say, well, Sammy Hager, is he one of the Hager twins from a Hee Haw, that you know, <laughs> like the country TV show? No, yeah. no, he, he was no. in the band Montrose. and. So, but being on that Boston tour, 78 through 79, really put us on the map because, again, we played in every state and and that's how we got going. Anyway, so uh, Sammy, uh, you know, again, a lot of fun, great guy. Uh, and Tom Scholes, 
uh, I'll I'll say when they put the list together of the hundred greatest guitar players of all time, he's always on there. Yep. But he's also on the list of a hundred greatest keyboard players. Cause you know, that's him playing on long time and those songs on the album. And there's nobody else in the world that's on both those lists. You know, it's amazing of, of keyboard and guitar. And then when they put together a hundred greatest rock songs, well, it's, you know, always a Boston song or two on that. Oh, and absolutely. He, wrote, he engineered the album, you know, produced it. Uh, and he designed the amplifiers that we use on stage. What a so genius. He's a real special guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's been my pleasure to to know him all these years. Oh, I bet. Yeah. So do you ever get tired of touring? Uh, not when we're on stage. <laughs> Those two hours we're on stage are the greatest. You know, you and people say, well, do you get tired of playing the same songs over because well, you got to do more than a feeling? Or that was my else. next question. Yeah. So I would get tired if I just had to sit in my living room and play those songs every night. But, you know, you stand up on stage and you got 10,000 people smiling and singing oh, yeah. along. And that just makes, you know, that makes everything worthwhile. That's the greatest feeling in the world right there. So you don't mind doing it? No. The other 22 hours of the day trying to get from this town to the next, you know, that's not as much fun. And people think, oh, you get to see everything. No, no, you you, you see the inside of the bus or a plane or a car or, you know, whatever, you know, just trying to get to the next town. And then once we get there, of course, we got to do sound check and then do the show and then get on the bus or the plane or the car to get to the next town. So we don't get to see much. Right. Well, after doing this for so many years, do you ever get nervous? Do you ever get excited before you take stage or is it just old hat? Uh, I'm always excited to go on stage. Yeah. And, uh, again it's the people you know that mm -hmm. we want to do our best you know it's a team thing right like you, you don't want to let the other team members down you want to be your best and sure and again the, the people are there and you again i look out in the audience and people are just smiling and singing along it's like you know what a great feeling so oh i've i've seen you many times and it is a great feeling it's more <laughs> than a feeling <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so in your early days who influenced you Gosh, all the great guitar players, of course, you know, Clapton and Jeff Beck and Jimi Hendrix, uh, going back before then, of course, Dwayne Eddy, you know, uh, and uh, I always liked the Everly Brothers growing oh, up, yeah. you know, terrific harmonies. And uh, uh, Elvis was a little bit before my time. You know, my sister liked Elvis. She was older. But uh, again, I, I liked, uh, you know, of, of course, once the 60s came along and, and those, uh, you know, terrific guitar players that sadly we just lost lost jeff beck a little while ago here but right uh, clapton and page are still around and yep. i i got to see Jimi hendrix live you know so wow that was, wow yeah wonderful thing that's a good memory yeah so i hear you have an interesting story about when you first started taking guitar lessons from somebody pretty special can you share that with us sure i i was on i was in high school high school band the other guitar player in the band said, hey, there's a guy giving lessons in the next town over. He's really good. We should all take lessons from him. I said, okay, great. So we went down there and I was too young to drive. Even, you know, somebody's mom had to drive us down there and we're taking lessons from this guy. And he was a little older than us. And he actually even had a, a couple of gray hairs on his head. And, <laughs> and one of one of his fingers was missing, but he could still play guitar great. And he was a good teacher, which is not always the case of good players, you know, but he understood our level of achievement yeah. and could talk sure. to us and explain how things worked. And, and I also noticed in the corner of his little, you know, rehearsal studio there, uh, he had a banjo and I, I'm thinking, well, that's not very rock and roll, you know, come on. You know, so why the banjo? He says, Oh man, I love bluegrass. And yeah, that, that's, that's mine. I said, Oh, okay. That really kind of opened my eyes. Like, yeah, you don't have to just play electric guitar to you know right. to be in a rock band. And so that was great. So we actually went to see his band perform. They were called the Warlocks. We uh -huh. saw them at Magoo, Magoo's Pizza Parlor. I think it was Palo Alto or something. They're in the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, a couple of months later, they changed their name to the Grateful Dead. And Unbelievable. J Jerry Garcia <laughs> was teaching us. And, of course, he stopped giving lessons at that time. <laughs> I, I'm sure he did. How long did you take lessons from him? Not too long, just a few months, you know, and then again, they, they got a record deal and the rest was history. What a story that is right place it's, at the right time again. Yeah. So I'll, I'll digress and uh, give you one other story of my high school time. Uh, again, I'm in a band high school and uh, 
my mother comes home from work and says, gee, I, I work with this woman, uh, Adele, that uh, has a son who plays guitar in a band too. But uh, she, they used to live in New Jersey and her son is still there. He's a little older than you. So he st stayed there to play with his band. And I uh, said, oh, okay, great. Yeah, everybody know plays guitar in a band, yeah. And so then right. years later, my mother says, well, didn't Adele's son do well in music? I said, oh yeah, the woman used to work with that office building. I said, yeah, Adele Springsteen. You're kidding me. <laughs> no way. But so my mom used to work with Bruce's mom. And That's so crazy. I'm telling, I'm telling this to my dad. My parents were divorced when I was about five or so. So I'm telling this to my dad. I said, Dad, you'll never guess. Mom used to work with, you know, Bruce Springsteen's mom. And my dad says, well, I work with Jay Giles' father. <laughs> no way. Are you <laughs> kidding me? What are the odds <laughs> of that? You know, <laughs> That's you crazy. Know, he, he never mentioned it. He said, oh, well, yeah, sure. You know? Never mentioned it. Yeah. Wow. This is not really a question. It's more of a statement, but I'll ask you anyway. Don't you think Boston has the coolest logo and record albums ever? <laughs> I mean, that guitar spaceship, is that crazy or what? That What a great concept. Uh, it is. <laughs> Yeah, and it's 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 lasted through the years. <laughs> oh, it's it's it, awesome. It's so identifiable, and and uh, yeah, it's, oh, it's such a fun thing. Totally. So, uh, how does the songwriting go? And do you write songs with the band? Does everybody write songs? Is just one person, or how, how does that work? Well, if you look on the credits on Boston albums, it's ninety nine point nine percent Tom Scholz. You know. Yeah. Uh, every, every once in a while, he'll have a collaborator. Uh, or I think Brad wrote one song just by himself. I think it was the "Let Me Take You Home Tonight," uh, mm -hmm. but that's that's usually been about it. You know, it's it's Tom's music. He's got the vision and all that, which was really the same way in Sammy's band too. You know, he was the songwriter. He had the vision of what he wanted the band to sound like, and he wrote the songs and he right. played them. You know, so that I got it's, you. It's same thing, yeah. But okay. now. Of course, uh, you know, back when I was in club band, we wrote our own music, and and uh, so I've continued to do that, obviously with Alliance and the Roads as well. So uh, I I guess I can't remember now where I diverged here, but the Roads. Okay. Uh, so I've been on Escape Records for these thirty years here, and the president there, Khalil, uh, uh, asked me to play on a tribute album to the record label, where they were going to get you know, like a whole bunch of musicians that had been on escape records to all play in a bunch of different songs. It was going to be a double album and they were going to uh, put this out as a, you know, a tribute to, uh, to escape records. And he asked me to to play and I said, Oh, thanks. Yeah. I'm flattered to be a part of that. And again, all the other great musicians that have been on the escape records all these years. And so he sent me a song uh, that had already been written and said, could you play guitar on this? And the demo he sent, was very complete. Somebody had played guitar on it and did, you know, blazing guitar solos and stuff. And I said, well, this is kind of already done. I don't want to just redo what this guy did. And he said, no, no, you should make it your own. I said, well, if you're giving me carte blanche on this, <laughs> yes. Then, uh, if, if it's up to me, I'd like to change a few things, but it's going to require changing the drum part. And he said, okay, sure. I said, well, so who played drums on this track? And he said, oh, that's Josh Devine, who had played drums with the, you know, the pop band uh, One Direction. And I said, well, man, he's a fantastic player. And and uh, Khalil said, yeah, call him up, talk to him. Here's, here's his number, call him up. And I talked to Josh, and he's an English guy. And uh, I said, uh, I'm thinking about changing the groove. I'd like to have like the, the first verse in halftime and then bust into full time for the chorus. He goes, Oh yeah, man, I'm all over that. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And so he redid the drums. Uh, I, I of course redid the guitar parts and changed them around completely from what was on there. And so right. that's what came out. And so as I was working with Josh on this, he said, gee, you know, uh, do you know my dad? Oh, well, I should say, I, I said, uh, I hope the songwriter doesn't mind us changing this. He goes, well, as a matter of fact, my dad wrote the song. And he said, you hmm. should talk to him. And I said, oh, okay, sure. And so before I could even call him, uh, Khalil had called back and said, hey, you know, Mick Devine, Josh's dad, wrote this song. He's a great singer, songwriter. Maybe you guys should just, you know, Chad, maybe you could, you know, write some songs together. Who knows why, you know? I said, okay, great. So I, I talked to him on the phone. And again, really nice guy. Right. And 
we said, yeah, well, how about we try to, you know, write a song or two together? Because he lives in England. I live in Boston. Oh. So we're going to do this through email, you know? Oh, Lord. Uh, but, you know, it's been done. So I said, okay, let's give that a shot. I said, now, you're a singer. You probably got some lyric ideas or melodies or this and that. And I got some guitar riffs. You know, we could somehow put these together. And he said, well, you know, as a matter of fact, I wrote a song and I had some other guys play on it. I didn't like the way it turned out, you know, but I liked the lyrics and the melody. Uh, and I said, okay, well, why don't you send that to me and I'll take a listen and see what I think about it. So he sent me his recording of just his vocal line. <laughs> no, oh. no metronome, no chords, no piano, no guitar. No, nothing. I had no idea what key it was in. Or oh, what no. It was. It's just like, da 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 like that's it that's all i got you know oh that's you know? terrible and I, so I, I said i'm up for the challenge i'm gonna do this and so i really i, I think this is the tempo you know and i yeah. found a, you know a tempo that seemed to work and and i'm playing guitar and i, I think these chords will work with his melody <laughs> And so I put it together and, and sent that to him. And he said, oh, this is great, you know. And the, the again, Khalil from the label said, oh, this is terrific. This is so good. You guys should keep going and we'll, you know, put out an album for you guys. And I said, okay. So after that, we got more, you know, collaborative that I'd have melody ideas or guitar riffs. We'd go back and forth. It was much easier after sure. that first one. Uh, but that was, uh, again, that was a challenge. That was a lot of fun. I bet it was. When you hear a Boston song, you know immediately that's a Boston song. What what gives Boston that unique sound? Well, it's usually two things that uh, give you the tip off of who that is playing. And certainly the guitar sound for Boston. And again, Tom Scholl's, you know, designed the amplifiers that we use. So they got that sound, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then, of course, the voice. You know, you hear somebody's voice and you can pick them out usually pretty easily. So... Both Brand Delp uh, has got that voice and and Tom Show uh, that guitar sound. In fact, I was I heard a song a little while back by I can't even remember who it was, but there was a slide guitar part in it, and I said, "Man, that sounds like Bonnie Raitt on slide guitar," and and but it was not her band, it's not her singing. You know, somebody else, a guy was singing and this and that. And at the end of the song, luckily they announced, "Oh, and that was so and so, and that's Bonnie Raitt playing slide guitar." I said, "Man, really? I knew." Just sounded like <laughs> her slide guitar playing, and she's just fantastic, of course. You know? oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to take you back in time. I know I'm picking your brain a little bit. Okay. We used to go every year. I'm in Waco, Texas, about an hour away from Dallas. Every year we went to the Texas Jam. Oh, yeah. And the Texas Jam, I believe, is one of your first gigs with Boston. Is that correct? Do you remember? Uh, well, uh, it was certainly early on, yeah. Uh, I'm Do you remember to... playing there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've played Texas Jam five times. Wow. It's fun, uh, four... isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in fact, we got to meet Emmett Smith in the hotel yeah. the, the night before. And, uh, you know, Chris, we're, it was at the Cotton Bowl, that one. Right. And he right. goes, oh, yeah, the Cotton Bowl. He said, I've been there. It's going to be yeah. about 110 degrees there it, it, on the field. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's yeah. hot. Yeah. And uh, I remember looking out into the sea of people and they had fire hoses hosing down oh, the people. Yeah, that's it was right. So hot, you know, <laughs> it was brutal. Yeah. But, um, uh, but way fun to play. I mean, gosh, you know, you get a stadium full of people ready to rock, you know, what's better than that, you know, and several bands to watch It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So, so I've, I've seen y'all many times. It's amazing to me that y'all sound almost the same in concert as you do on the record how do you do that a lot of work <laughs> and a lot of it comes from tom Scholz. you know he knows exactly what things should sound like to to make him you know duplicate on the record perfectionist now, sure yeah yeah uh and so uh, again the fact that he designed the amps well okay we got the amp sound here it is right and the way that the amps are designed uh we take what's called a direct signal right out of the back of the amp. So you don't have to have the amp go through speakers and then a microphone on the speaker. 
it's it's direct just the way like keyboards are they they you know you can plug them in directly to the pa system so that's the way our amps are set up so you don't have to worry about the microphone moving or different kind of mic or it gets knocked over or, or the humidity uh or you know the barometric pressure i mean it's all those things that can change the sound of a guitar amp you don't have to worry about that because it's all direct right through the amp right to the pa system interesting so that's that's that and then of course for the actual playing parts uh again when i first joined the band you know tom sat down with me and we went through all the songs make sure that I knew the right part. And of course, there are a lot of guitar harmony parts in there. Right. So you got to make sure you're playing the right part. You know, it's going to clash yeah. with the other guy. Right. So so we certainly spent uh, time doing that. And then same with all the vocal parts. Uh, again, in, when Brad, you know, Brad was with us, of course, to start with. And he knew all the parts because he sang all the parts on the record. Right. And so so he would make usually make a like a cassette tape of each vocal part and give it to everybody so that they would know their part to sing because he knew them all, you know? So between knowing the guitar parts and of course, since Tom recorded uh, all the bass and the keyboards, he knew how those went. And, uh, and, and again, because he had recorded himself and he was the engineer and producer, he knows every single beat of the drum pattern. And so again, when he, we've had different drummers in the band and he just said, just play what's on the record, man. That's all you got to do. <laughs> uh, but then there are a couple of songs that we uh, can, you know, uh, improvise on, like Walk On. It's a long song. And in the middle, you know, uh, I, I do a solo, you know, there's a bass solo. And, and Tom just says, hey, do whatever you want. Go ahead, you know, have at it, you know. And That's a couple good. of other songs like that, too, like at the end of a song, hey, just play whatever you want. Go ahead. It's, you're, you know, you're on your own. Just do it, you know. That's cool. So there, there's some, yeah, some parts uh, on the set where we get to, you know, be different every night. Yeah. That's fun. How yeah. you've been doing this a long time. Do you have any plans on retiring? <laughs> are you not just going really. to, you just going to do this forever? Well, and why not? I mean, it's why just, not? Yeah. Uh, so uh, of course our last tour with Boston was 2017 and we had done four years in a row. Uh, you know, was that uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, which was more than the band had ever done. You know, usually we only did an album and tour yeah. together. So there were some some gaps, some large gaps between albums and tours. But, uh, you know, we just got on a roll there. We're having a great time. And so we did four years in a row. And Tom said, well, let's take off a year, you know. And and then uh, then COVID hit. And so here we are mm -hmm. kind of still waiting. Some of our friends, of course, are back out on the road. But we'll hear stories like, oh, they were on the road for a couple of weeks and one of the guys got COVID and now they're off the road. And so we're kind of waiting to see how things uh, shake out with that. I was going to ask you, are there any plans for a Boston tour anytime soon? Nothing specific. Uh, but I had asked Tom about that, about retiring, you know, and, and I said, you know, do you ever think about retiring? He says, no, no way. I, I want to keep going. And Absolutely. So I I certainly hope that uh, we we will again. And And certainly it seems like it's Tom's intention as well. Long overdue. Yeah. So do you, do you have a favorite guitar that you use or, or a go-to guitar that you use? Or I I do. Can you see some of the guitars behind me? Oh, here? I can see them. Yes. I feel like Let I'm in grab... Guitar Center. Can you, can you see this? I can. This is a PRS, uh, PRS standard 24. I mean, it's got 24 frets. And this is the guitar I use on stage in Boston. Okay. And it's uh, it's the S2. Uh, it's made in America, but it's not their top of the line. And uh, I like it because it's got this beveled edge, which mm -hmm. the, the other models don't. They've got a sharper pointed edge. And I like the way this one feels on my arm, you know? Right. So... Uh, that and it sounds great, feels great. The neck is terrific. It's got 24 frets, which I need, and it sounds great. Works great. So this is my guitar. This is the one I use on stage with Boston. Cost seven hundred and fifty dollars. Wow, really? Well, he went down to Guitar Center and bought yeah. one just like this for seven hundred fifty bucks. You know, but that's for me. That works. That's that's it. That's my go-to Boston guitar. Gotcha. Cool. 
I was watching a YouTube video of y'all last night, and you were standing at a, a stationary guitar, oh, but yeah. you but you had a guitar on. You played both. Yes. So I'd never seen that done. Oh yeah, um, it's uh, an acoustic guitar stand. So right. the acoustic is on a stand that right. can stand alone by itself, and it's up at the right height. So I just walk up to it, and I can play that. And of course, I've got my other one still on, so it's it's probably banging against the back a little bit, you know, because they're both right there. Uh, but I try not to, you know, make too much noise, banging them together, whatever. But so I do that. And then I switch to the electric. So I do that certainly in the song, more than a feeling where it starts. Yes. With the acoustic, That's the one. Switch, yeah. Then I switch over to the electric and, uh, again, part of the system that Tom invented was a switcher so that I can switch between the acoustic guitar and then my electric so that only one is active at, at the time, right? You don't want them both on because the other be playing, playing, playing on yeah, one guitar, one right. playing the other. So it, it mutes one and then turns the other one on with just a step of a, of one button. So I'll play the acoustic and then hit the button for the next part for, for, that's electric, you know, whatever, and uh, back and forth. I thought that was so cool. i never seen that. I mean, I just hadn't noticed it. Yeah. So I'm almost done with my questions. I don't know I'm, I'm keeping you longer, but... Why does it take so long for a Boston for Boston to make a freaking album? <laughs> uh, t Tom always said that the first album took him at least four years to make. That's uh, crazy because he it, is a perfectionist, and so, so he'll have a song idea and work on it for a long time and try different uh, things about it. You know, he'll change chords and tones and this and that, and just to you know to experiment to try to get the best sound and and all that. And he has said that he'll work on a song for, you know, sometimes months and then throw it away. It's like, no, nah, oh, it's just not working right. Yeah, it's not. No not way. Right. So that's that it's not because he's slow, it's because he's just experimenting with all the different sounds and, and textures and all that stuff. And and of course, vocal lines. And since he plays all the bass on all the albums, that's that's him working up the bass line or a keyboard part. And so that, that just takes a long time. It takes a long time. So you're um, interested in the engineering aspect of things. Are you in charge of the stage setup and the lasers and the the big <laughs> the big TV thing in the back? Do you do that too? Uh, not much. <laughs> uh, okay. But uh, to give you an example, though, uh, so again, I joined the band and started working with Tom at the company at the Shoals Research and Development, the Rockman Company, uh, where. You know, we made the amplifiers that we use on stage. And I had uh, taken high school electronics, so I knew a little bit about that. And even when I was in Sammy's band, I, I made a few devices that we use. I, I made a tube preamp that Sammy had used for a while and a, a switching device that he had used for a while. And so uh, I, I always enjoyed making tube amps. And then when I started uh, playing with Boston, uh, Again, Tom had this company, and they were going to go to the NAM show, the National Association of Music Merchandisers, to show new products. And so uh, he said, "Gee, one, you know, we're about to go to this show. We have some new products. Why don't you come down to the office and take a listen to what we got and let us know what you think? You know, we're looking for new opinions for this stuff." So I go down there, and the other engineers working there are all musicians as well, and so you know, we're playing this stuff and oh, that sounds good and we should change this and blah, blah, blah. And so they had a few of the prototypes there that they were going to take to this show. And so, you know, we'd make a decision, say, okay, we're going to add more treble or bass or something to this particular sound. And so the guys got out the soldering irons and their soldering changing components. And I said, well, I know how to solder. Let me help out. And so I, you know, started doing that. And, and uh, once we got back from the trade show, I, just kept going back to the office and helping out where I could. And one day Tom said, you know, we've got this problem with this one circuit here that we're using a FET, a field effect transistor. We're having problems with it, with the temperature coefficient. And could you take a look at that? I said, me, you want me to do that? You got engineers. He said, yeah, but they're busy doing other stuff. And there's a lot of red tape. Can you just take a look at this? I said, okay, sure. You know, so I, I looked into that. And uh, so uh, so then in 87, when we were going to do the tour, 
we were going to use all this new gear that we had just made. And we hired some crew guys and they had never seen this stuff before. And it doesn't look like regular guitar amps with, you know, a, a knob, volume, treble, middle, bass. No, it's like switches and sliders and LEDs that light up. And they had no idea how to work this stuff at all, how to plug it in or what it's supposed to do, you know. Right. So Tom and I were the only guys that knew how the equipment worked. And we had to show the, our crew guys, well, here's how you plug it in and all that. So I started doing that. And of course, uh, we're always interested in, in how it sounds. And so after the show each night, they'd usually make a tape, either, either a cassette or a DAT or a CD or now digital, you know, over, over the years. And so oh, I'd yeah. always be li listening to those. And uh, I also knew a little bit about graphics. One of my hobbies and avocations is photography. And so I knew a little bit about that. So at one point we had some uh, spaceship windows that would open that look like you're in the cockpit of, you know, like the Enterprise oh. or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I had made those graphically and they used those on the on set. So I've had my hand in a little bit of everything yeah. along the way. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, the last thing we do is our fun fast five. It's, we ask you five fun questions. It tells you about yourself. You get six because you're so special. <laughs> uh, so are you ready to play? Okay. I hope I, I hope I can do think fine. enough here. You'll do fine. But trust me, what was one of your favorite TV shows growing up? TV. Oh, gosh. You know, I like the real McCoys. The real McCoys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, I'll just I'll digress and say my mother, who actually went on to be a writer, a novelist, oh, yeah. uh, always didn't like the real McCoys because they used the word ain't. <laughs> <laughs> she said, oh, you shouldn't watch that. That's they don't use correct grammar in there. Yeah. Said, yeah but, uh, but mom, it's a, it's a nice family show. So there you go. <laughs> good one. So what's your favorite type of food or a favorite meal that you have? I know you're a vegetarian. Yeah. So do you have a favorite dish or a favorite food that you like to eat? Absolutely. My wife's green pea stew. Green pea stew. <laughs> yes. So it's got potatoes and carrots and, of course, green peas and yeah. celery and, and spices and stuff. And that's that's my favorite. <laughs> gotcha. Do you remember the first car that you ever had? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It was a truck. <laughs> yeah okay because i was in a band i needed something to haul my gear around so it was a, a chevy c10 which are very popular now yeah. uh you know so it's like a 1966 uh c10 but it was the panel van not a not a pickup but a panel van so the, mm -hmm. the back was enclosed no windows in the back but of course that's what i needed to sure uh, to carry the gear in it had you know six cylinder engine in it and uh, I put many miles on that with the gear in the back. Good memory. Yeah. Do you have a favorite vacation spot that you like to go to? Uh, again, absolutely. That's an easy one. Uh, Yosemite National Park. Okay. Uh, my dad first took me there when I was a teenager in high school. And it's such a beautiful place. I don't know if you've ever been, but. No, I seen, have not. You've ever seen pictures of it. Anyway, it's yeah. such the, the valley there, Yosemite Valley is so unique. It's got huge granite cliffs and waterfalls and in half dome is the big granite, uh, you know, dome over at the end of the valley. And it's, it's like no other place on earth. I mean, where else could you go to see these cliffs and waterfalls and, you know, of course the mountains and the trees and all that. It's just so spectacular. So I used to go there again, first off with my dad and then mm -hmm. with my friends and then when I met my girlfriend in high school, we'd go there and just for the weekend, you know, we, and so mm -hmm. we said, well, when we get married, that's where we're going to get married. So that's exactly what we did. We oh, really? went to Yosemite National Park and there's a little chapel there in cool. the valley. And that's where we got married. That is cool. What is one of the coolest venues you've ever played at that you remember? Yes, there have been some beautiful theaters uh, just right here in Boston, the Wang Theater. But all, all around the country, there's, you know, some wonderful theaters that uh, they were old, either music venues, you know, from the old days or or theaters that, that they had a screen, you know, a movie screen in it. So there's some of those and I can't even remember all the names of them. Yeah, again, I remember right. the Wang because that's that's here. Sure. 
So th th those are really special places. I, I certainly like those. And they're not too big. You know, when you, unfortunately, when you play a stadium or something, the sound isn't always the best because the guy in the back row at the top yeah. of the bleachers, yeah. he wants it just as loud as the guy in the front row, you know? That's true. Absolutely. And so they, they've they been better over the years, you know, where they can they fly the sound so that it's not hitting the guy in the front row. It's up in the air so it gets to the back. It's gotten much, much better, of course, over the last 40 years. Right. But th those are some of the hard, hardest places to sound good at, whereas a, a theater, it's like the acoustics are great. And so that, that's just a wonderful thing to play in a place where you know it sounds good and everybody in the building can, you know, feels that, that it sounds great. Right. Good. Last question for you. If you had to pick one, what would it be? Elvis, the Beatles, or the Rolling Stones? I have to say the Beatles for me. The yeah. Beatles. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You probably uh, know the Rolling Stones. <laughs> no, I've never met them. Nor really? the Beatles either. But uh, I have to say the Beatles. And they, uh, what, what strikes, uh, again, I'll digress and tell a little story about that. Good. So, I was just at the right time. I, again, I'm, I was a little too young for Elvis. Again, right. uh, uh, my sister liked him, uh, older sister. Uh, the Beatles came along and they were exactly in sync with my maturity. So their uh -huh. first song in 63, so I was 12 turning 13 in 63, was I Want to Hold Your Hand, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm 12 years old. And that's about as far as I thought I could go with a girl. <laughs> You know, oh yeah, well, I want to hold your hand. You know, you all know, of us are that way, right? Yeah, twelve years old, but by the time I got to be sixteen, they were singing, "Why don't we do it in the road?" <laughs> <You know? laughs> so every album they did was a progression in sound style and, of course, song maturity as well, and and it fit exactly along with my maturity at the same time. And that uh, I tell that to, you know, younger people that, oh, I love the Beatles. I said, yeah, but when you were there and you were just yeah. the right age for each yeah. album. And again, I remember every time an album came out, it was a big deal on the radio. Like, okay, the new, you know, Beatle album is coming out. It comes out like whatever, like July 1st. And so July 1st at the stroke of, you know, midnight plus one, you know, at 1201, we're going to play the whole Beatle album, wow. you know, top to bottom. It was that big a deal. So they were, you know, really special. And and because every new, every album had a new sound to it. You know, it was, it, it was just great. Good, good answer. That's all the time I have. That's all the questions I have for you. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've had fun. I hope you had fun as well. Well, it's, it's certainly nice to remember the old times. And uh, yeah. again, I knock on wood and count my blessings that I was, yeah. you know, in the right place at the right time to, have Sounds like it. Career. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for coming on. You're welcome, Tony. Good, good luck to you. And nice to meet your family there, too. Well, thank you very much. And for all you watching, we always appreciate your time. Hit that subscribe button and hit the like button and stay tuned for more cool interviews with talking with Tony. So until next time, peace out.